my mic sounds nice. Check one. I said my microphone sounds nice when it is on. Check two. Welcome to another episode of Beyond the Rim, the podcast. Hashtag BTR. And I am your host, the Dudster, Nestor Dudley. And tonight, my guest is the president of Malden Overcoming Addiction, Paul Hammersley. Hammer time. Say hello to the peeps who happen to be streaming us right now. Nestor, it's an honor to be on your show. I, I just uh, I can't thank you enough for asking me to come on and, and talk about Malden Overcoming Addiction. I, I'm really looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to this podcast as well. And your schedule is so full from doing Malding Overcoming Addiction to doing your regular job, that the job that you pay the bills with. And it took us several months to try to get this podcast together. And I would like to know, brother, before we get into this podcast, when do you sleep? Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, you, you know, I get my rest, but it's pretty much uh, like you said, you know, this Malden overcoming addiction has really um, three years ago when we when we tried to uh, when we got together and, and thought about what we could do in the community to try to help folks struggling with addiction. We we had no idea what, you know, what it was going to turn into. And, and it's been I'm 100 percent volunteer work. Um so I do have a regular job and I, I put in my hours every week and then I, I do Malden overcoming addiction at night or late in the afternoon weekends. And I also have my own private business, 3MG, but um, yeah, the Malden overcoming addiction thing has, it's just grown. It, it almost has tentacles off it. There's, there's all kinds of different areas now with volunteers working um, everything from recovery coaches to um, I have a full board, uh, board of trustees. We we have become a 501c3 nonprofit. And, you know, as the podcast goes on, we can dig a, a little bit deeper into everything. But, you know, I, I do try to get my rest, but it is very busy. And thank God I have a loving wife who, uh, who accepts what I do. And I've met your loving wife and you got a beautiful daughter at home. You have a very beautiful family, my brother. So let's get into this. Tell us about Malding Overcoming Addiction. For the streamers out there who do not know where Malding Overcoming Addiction is located, it is located in Malden, Massachusetts, which is 5.5 miles north of Boston. Take it away, That's Hannah. correct. We, got, we probably have six, close to 65,000 residents here in the city and. uh you know, like I said about three years ago, the bottom line is uh, I, you know, I'm sick and tired of watching people die from the disease of addiction. So we, we thought we could try to, um, you know, what can we do here in Malden in our community to try to make a difference? So we 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 decided to start having some events. We, we our first event was a vigil where we honored people. Um, who had passed away we we didn't want people who who have died of a drug overdose to be forgotten we want them to live on and be remembered especially with their families so we started with a vigil and where was this vigil held uh it, it was held it's always held on um, we've had three already and they've been held at Malton high school okay um so what we do is we everybody meets on the high school steps and it's around the month of october um usually this week of october and we march around with candles around the high school and if it's raining, we go inside the gallery, and if it's um, not raining, we, we have it in the courtyard, and, you know, we, we show pictures of all the people we've lost. We have some speakers come in, and, you know, and, and I, I have to talk about it. everything starts at the top. So, um, you know, Mayor Christensen, Senator Lewis, the police chief, Kevin Molas, you know, we have the support of the whole city, and everybody's on board and trying to, to help all that overcoming addiction. Um, you know, thrive and prosper just to, we're trying to get the community the resources that they need. So, you know, it, that was the start of it. And we continued that we have six running events. You know, we have Malden Overcomes Day in August. We have the Vigil in October. We have Celebrate Sober in January. Um, we just had Stop the Stigma Day. That's in April. We have two fundraisers in between all of this. So it's um, every it averages out to every eight weeks. We have a major event 
to um, spread awareness, prevention, education on the disease of addiction. I was not aware that you're having an event every eight weeks, every eight weeks throughout the year, correct? That's what that's what it works out to be because there is, uh, you know, there, there's six of this, there's five events that we do for the city and now we just threw in two fundraisers. So actually this, there's seven and we're volunteers. And as you can imagine, it, you know, for every event, it takes a lot of planning, a lot of strategizing, a lot of people are involved and everyone is, is volunteering. So, and also on top of all of that, we've run three recovery coach academies in the past year. So now that's 10 events that we've run in the past 12 months. What does it take, Paul, to become a recovery coach? Uh, to become a recovery coach. So, you know, that, that that's a great question because a lot of people get confused. Um, it starts with something called the Recovery Coach Academy there that which will get you a, certif- a certification of completion. That's 30 hours of intensive training over the course of five days, either four or five days. However, that particular trainer wants to work it. They can do four 10 hour days, however they work it. But you end up walking away with a, um, a certificate of completion. Now, what that allows you to do, that allows you to coach but, uh, you know, you, you're not a certified addiction recovery coach, which is called a CARC, C-A-R-C, which I went and did that. So I am certified. So what that means is other than just taking the academy, there's five to seven other trainings you have to take um, to get. They're called CEUs, sort of like um, credits. And you have to get the CEUs. You have to put in 500 hours in the field, working in the field of addiction coaching. You have to have a, you know, some supervision. Someone has to sign off on your hours. So there's a bunch of things you can do to get your cock. But you can, just by taking the academy, work as a recovery coach as long as you're being supervised and pushing towards your goal. And it took me about, it took me about 14 months to, uh, to get my certification wow 14 months so one year two months how many recovery coaches does moa have present time so we've trained 83 and again we've trained 83 that have went through our recovery coach academy okay so and we also have five supervisors and we're working with uh we're currently working with 25 we call them recoveries because we have a link on our website that if folks you know, some folks, a recovery coach, let's just start here. It's, uh, it's peer to peer. A recovery coach is sort of like someone's cheerleader. They're, they're re- we call them the resource broker. So if somebody might be struggling with the disease of addiction, a recovery coach is there to help that person through that time where they're struggling. It's just one who it's um, we don't judge folks. We sit with you. Um, we talk with you. If you need some type of assistance, if you need a detox, we can navigate that system for you. If you need sober living, we can navigate that. If you just want to talk, we'll talk to you. Our job is just to how can we improve the quality of your life and how can we help you just get through the day? That's a recovery coach job. It's really just meeting someone where they're at. So what that could mean if somebody was using heroin, and they might be using three to four bags a day. Our goal is how can we get you to use two bags a day and then bring you down to, to helpfully, how can we get you to stop using? Okay, so it's not about trying to get somebody in a cold turkey state of mind. You just The goal is to, to wean them down. The goal is to meet them where they're at. If they don't want to stop using, my job is not to tell you to stop using. My job is just to talk with you and maybe say things to you like, well, gee, with your using, how is your job working out? I mean, how is your sleep pattern? Usually someone that might be using their life is in turmoil. Um, you know, whether they're not holding a job, they can't function in, in society. So we, we try to point those things out to folks. Um, you know, like obviously, you couldn't hold down a job if you were um, if you were really using a lot and consistently. Things would leave your life because, like, gee, how, what does that look like for you if your urine is positive for for a substance? So, you know, maybe we should think about how can we get your urine to be negative. Like, let's talk about what that would look like. You know, things like that. So it's interesting because you mentioned that. 
it would be difficult to hold down a job if you're using, if you're addicted. Difficult. Not impossible, but difficult. And but well, I think I referenced to heroin. Like if you're if you know, it, it's when you're using full time, um Nesta, when 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 you're using full time it's uh it's very noticeable. It's hard to do anything but use that. That's all you do. That's all you think about. Um, and when you're so using really, full time, I don't mean to cut you off, but if you're using full time, you're not holding down a job, right? Normally or usually. Um, some people can, you know, because they need that money. But it generally what happens is it is it takes a toll on your family, on your job. And then you basically end up alone because, you know, you, you can't perform um, in a family matter at a work level. You know, you can only perform in one area and that, you know, using is a full time job. Um, and one of three things will happen to you, and that's a jail institution or death. There's no way around it. So that's that's where the coaching comes in. We try to point all these things out and try to guide you to a better life and try to guide you to to see it's it's promoting healthy living. OK, you know, it, it's promoting health and wellness. It's promoting the bottom line, it's just promoting a better way of life and how to function in society. You mentioned your website earlier. Can you give us that website address? Yeah, the website is uh, MaldenOvercomingAddiction.com. And when you go there, there's just a series of tabs on there. Everything is there from we, we have a show on um, Malden Access Television. Um, it's called Overcoming Addiction. Every month we bring a different episode in wit. You know, and what we think people might want to be interested in every single month, different topic, um, such as one month is Narcan training. One month we had learn to cope on for families, family resources. One month we had recovery coaches on. One month we had young people in recovery on. You know, every month is a different topic. We just are trying to educate, um, you know, the city and beyond on the disease of addiction and, and that we're here to help. And on our website, you can get a recovery coach. You can also, we also have a, um, a, a scholarship program for Malden residents only. If um, one of the main things, Nestor, is um, when people get out of a detox after five or six days, they end up coming back to the place they were five or six days prior to that. And the relapse rate is very high. Usually people need further treatment, and if you don't have the proper insurance or you can't afford to go to long-term treatment, you just end up going back home, and usually it, it doesn't end well for you. Usually, you know, you end up picking up right where you left off. So we offer a scholarship program. If you fit our criteria, we have a form on our website. We will send you to Sober Living for the first four weeks. We pay for it, and in those four weeks, there are some things that you – um you know, you sign that you would do for us, which is we would assign you a, a coach to work with. And hopefully um, you have to find a job in the first couple of weeks of you being in the house. So on week number five, our goal is to to get you to start paying your own rent so we could get 30 days under your belt that we'd pay for. And then hopefully on the fifth week you have found that job and then you have Basically, you need time to get well. So we're taking you at the five to six day mark after detox and we're giving you a shot at life. We're going to put you in this house with with sober people, people doing the right thing. We're going to try to help you find um, a job and, and hopefully you can get back on track. Now, Paul, what happens to the individual that goes through this program, goes through this five days of detox, of clean living, of all the stuff that you had just said? What happens to this individual when this individual goes back into the area or the home or wherever that began them? Are you talking about after the detox? So, so let's let's start at the beginning. So a person okay. realizes they might need help, and they and then they they might call Malden Overcoming Addiction because I do this all week long. People what is the phone me, number? What is the phone number for Malden Overcoming Addiction? It's seven eight one eight three eight. Two two zero three. That's oh. a direct line. That's my cell. Okay, thank you. Con um, continue, please. Yeah, yeah, and I and I can get you right to where you need to be. Whatever resources you need, we're we're pretty plugged in around the state. So basically, when someone needs help, you know they're looking for a bed. We can um, help you find that detox. Yep. And then it's up to you. So you have to take the next step. But again, the detox is in Massachusetts. Usually run five to seven days. 
Okay. And and, and then you have a decision to make. And uh, we really strongly recommend further treatment because the, the um, you know, it, it's it's a really high percentage of folks. If you don't go to further treatment, it might even be in the 90 percentile that um, relapse, you know, after five to seven days, if you don't choose to go to um, further treatment. What happens to the individual that goes to five to seven days and then they get out and they said, you know, five to seven days, I'm good. I got it under control. I'm not going to relapse. Maybe I'll potty now and then, but I'm good. I don't need further treatment. You know, I don't want to. I don't want to project about that person, but um, a lot of people think just that. Well, that's my, a lot of, yeah. Well, my question was going to be that person that think that they got it licked after five to seven days. Then a week or two goes by, and they're like, "Oh, gee, I really don't have this lick." Can they come back? Of course they can. Like, are you suggesting that if they make a mistake and relapse? If they make a mistake and relapse. Uh, yes, of course they can. Yes. Well, I'll help you again. Okay. We, we don't we don't ever ever turn our back on anyone at any time for any reason. Um And I think that's very that, important. I think that's very important that that message is out there. I kind of knew the answer, but I want to use say it. I want to get it exactly on the record because we are all human beings, we are all flawed creatures. And That's correct. Yes. And um myself included um if uh, in nine more days, Lord willing, I will have 15 years in recovery. April 23rd is my 15 years. But to answer your question, um, fit, you know, before 15 years ago, there was a five year period where I was in and out of detoxes. I can't even count how many treatment facilities because I went, you know, it was near the end for me. And I would go to a treatment facility, get out thinking I was good. I would make a mistake again, and in this, it's just a cycle that happens, and we see the cycle now. A lot of people, um, they they just do the same cycle. They they do the we call it like it's almost like a shuffle. They'll go into detox just because they're so beat down, they need a break. So they go into detox. They get five or six days under their belt. They go back out. They use, go back to detox, and they and they run this wheel, and they do this all the time but what happens is you can die let's just face it like every time you go back out there's a really high risk that you're not going to come back so we try to stress that like now is the time once you first go to that detox we're really trying to educate people to go to further treatment because with the drugs the way they are today and how powerful they are a lot of people don't get a second chance Wow, it's powerful stuff that you just said. First of all, I want to congratulate you on being 15 years clean. That's almost, a, almost. Almost. Almost 15 years clean. Still a day at a time. Thank you, though. One day at a Thank time. Thank you, Mr. One day at a time. I want to you know, congratulate you on that. And I can tell and hear the passion in your voice doing this. This is obviously something that you really believe in. This is a way for, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but this is a way for you to give back to the Malden community, Correct. 100 percent that's um you know that that really drives me this is where i grew up this is where you know this is where it went bad for me um my own choices nobody's choices but my own but growing up i was just um you know i i made some mistakes and uh you know so i i now i just want to I, i'm trying to help prevent people from from going through what i went through and it's all about giving back to the community. And this whole thing, it's just about helping another human being. It's about paying it forward. And no one has to stay out there as long as I did. I am a true believer that everything happens for a reason. So thank you for being honest about your past. Maybe these things had to happen to you with your past so you would eventually come on to be the president of Malden Overcoming Addiction and helping others out there that are addicted. So maybe this was your path in life. Well, it's been the path the whole time, and I believe that as well, Esther. Um, you know, God had a plan for me. I don't want to get into the whole God thing, but I don't know why that I was chosen to continue this fight. You know, all people I grew, grew up with are, are gone. They're all dead. Um, 
you know, I, I just keep pushing to help folks. Things are really bad and someone has to do this work. Like, I'm not saying there's no one else that's doing it. There are plenty of people doing it, but if, if, People or if an organization such as Malden Overcoming Addiction stops doing what they're doing, a lot more people will die. So I'm just a firm believer of there's a way out and, and, and we can do this. And I love helping the community like a strong community is a better community and, and our community needs help. And as far as I'm concerned, I'm just not going to stop. We're, we're just going to keep pressing forward. And, the, and that's that. I'm not sure if we mentioned this earlier, but Malden Overcoming Addiction is a nonprofit, correct? Yes, yes. That happened, uh, that was just, just about a year ago. Um, again, that was one of the big moves that we had to make because this thing just kept getting bigger and bigger. So now we're able to fundraise. So we, we did, um, yes, we, we did seek an attorney and, and, and we went through that process and we are uh, registered with the state and and I am the chairman of that board. Um, so yes, to answer your question, yes, we are we are a nonprofit five hundred one c three. I am on your website right now, MaldenOvercomingAddiction dot com. The menus you have up there, upcoming events, latest news, resources, recovery coach, and donate. I want to emphasize donate. So all you streamers out there, if we've had said something thus far that piques your interest. Go to MaldingOvercomingAddiction.com, and this program is a nonprofit, 501c3. Any type of donation, any type of donation, big or small, would help this organization. So, Paul, I just gave you a plug. Thank you. Thank you, Nestor. Um, again, the work we do, uh, if you're listening and you heard all the events that we do, um, Two years ago, these events that we were doing and all the work we were doing, there was five core members that were emptying their checking account, including myself. And then we would try to raise money to pay ourselves back. And and so, you know, now we're, we're much bigger. So we run fundraisers and um, the fundraisers that we have been running, thank God, have been paying for the events. But we, we don't have much funds we are just a small cog in the wheel and we always need more funding so if people if people uh it, unfortunately money takes care of everything and we need we need funding um so yes if anyone would like to donate they could donate right on our website and 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 we would really appreciate it but 100 percent of the proceeds just goes back into fighting the disease of addiction a lot of it goes to our scholarship program like i said it cost us about a thousand dollars to put somebody into sober living, and this year we're very proud to say, in the past twelve months, we have put six people through sober living. So it, it you know, it's working. Very good. Well, Paul, I think this is an excellent time right now to go into our break, our second part of this program. Right after the break, we're going to talk about the recent Stop the Stigma Day. So. Right now, Beyond the Rim, BTR, hashtag BTR. I am your host of Deadstead, Nesta Dudley, along with Paul Hammersley, who is the president of Malden Overcoming Addiction. And after we come back from this break, and this break, matter of fact, is going to be a production from the Malden High Media. Production from Malden High Media about Stop the Stigma Day. So we will return on the other side of the break. I decided to get help. What do you need help with? I got issues with alcohol, drugs, you know, nothing too major, but 
Yeah, no. Definitely. I mean, but you got it under control, yeah. right? But this Friday, they required me to bring a sponsor to my meeting, but I don't have anyone I can trust. Or, you know. Yeah, I, I, I got you. Whoa, I wasn't expecting that. How am I gonna handle this? Maybe I should leave. How would I want someone to handle it if it were me? I would offer support and I would tell them that I was really proud that they have confided in me and want to seek help. First off, I'd be really honored that they confided in me because it's very hard for someone who's struggling to actually open up. So I'd be honored as well as I would help them take the steps into overcoming their addiction and make sure they're um, feeling safe in the first moment because if they're not, then it's, um, it's, I gotta make sure that to take action, right, if they're not feeling safe in the moment, but if they are, I would help them and I'd let them talk before I talk because it's about them and not about me. So I wanna make sure that they feel like it's safe for them to vent to me. And I wanna make sure that they would get the help they need, whether it would be going to an adjustment counselor or if they feel personally that they need to talk to me before taking other steps with other resources. The first thing I would tell whether it was a student or an adult, is that I care about them and that I appreciate that they came to me and that I will do everything I can to help them. And then the next thing I would say to kind of ease their concerns is that everything that we go through is confidential and we will help them deal with whatever issues that they are dealing with at the time. I would then find them help, help them myself as best I could. Well, for starters, if a friend confided in me that they were struggling with an addiction, I wouldn't pressure them or patronize them in a way, but I would definitely try to ensure that they would try to receive the help that they need from um, positive resources so that they wouldn't have to continue struggling with an addiction. And quite honestly, I would thank them for confiding in me because that means that they trust that I might be a better person to talk to. I think the first step we do is we assure that the person is okay in the moment. Let them know that they're supported and find out that they're okay in the moment. If there's medical help that needs to be provided on the spot, we make sure we triage it, so to speak, to make sure that medical help is provided as needed. And the next step is we find them the counseling that they need. Malden High School is resource rich. Whether it be adjustment counselors in the building or our connections to outside agencies, we're resource rich and we can get the help of literally any kind of services we need at the drop of a hat. The best way to help someone overcome addiction is to support them, help them, give them everything they need. Offer them support, tell them that I'm there and that I'm glad that they came to me and were confident that I could help them. Uh, to never give up and always to find uh, the right person or someone that can help you with the program uh, or someone that can help you uh, overcome your addiction. Well, I'm free Friday night. What about the party? What about it? I mean, I wouldn't want you to miss it. I, I'd rather go with you. Why can't I be your sponsor? I, I want to see you through this, because if anything were to happen to you, I would miss you a lot more than I'd miss any party. Thanks, man. I got you, bro. Let's go. Back after that break and the Malden High Media, what a promo that they put out for Malden Stop the Stigma. That was very, very impressive. Back here, Paul Hammersley, the president of Malden Overcoming Addiction. Paul, let's talk about the video that the high school put together, high school media put together. 
Yeah, um, nothing short of amazing. So, you know, Stigma Day, um, it, this was our third annual, and it's a couple of years ago, the, uh, the high school, we, we one of the main things that we try to do, so people are going to continue to use, people are going to continue to die, and we can we can treat them, we can educate them, we can do as much prevention as we want. But at Maldon Overcoming and Dickin, we're convinced until we get to the generation that's below us, the kids, this is not going to stop. The kids, we feel, are not being educated in a manner where um, they're learning about addiction. So I think health class is a big part of it. Um, but until we can figure out how to get the funding, because everything comes down to funding, we feel that our kids need to be educated on anything they can about addiction. So Stop the Stigma Day is geared at the kids because stigma prevents a lot of people from doing a lot of things. It's Stigma is one of the leading barriers for people with substance use disorder seeking treatment. We must, remo- we must remove the stigma associated with substance use to help create change and improve the health of our community. Um, You know, stigma is judgment. Stigma is if you look different than someone else, if your skin color is different, it can affect so many things. If you have, if you are mentally challenged in any way, there's so many things that could cripple you. If you're using drugs, you don't want people to know that you're doing that, especially if you're a young person. We, We try to hide everything and we alienate and that's the worst thing we can do. And then the other side of that is people judge people. So I like to use the the example, the person that's sitting out front of Dunkin' Donuts, they might have a cup and it says homeless. Can you spare any change? I've been guilty of this until I educated myself on stigma. The first thing I used to think was oh, he's just going to get high with it or he's going to drink. Meanwhile, I don't know that person from a hole in the wall. I have no idea what that person has been through. I don't know anything about that person. That person just might be someone that's down and out on their luck. So we feel that trying to educate our youth would be a great way to start the process getting into the school system. So uh, a couple of years ago, they let us go into the seventh and eighth grade level. And this year, they actually let us get into uh, sixth grade level. So we visit on Stigma Day. We get a chance to go around to every school in the city. Um, all, every Malden public school in the city, including Chevrolet and including Malden Catholic. I set this up personally with each principal. First, I, you know, I set it up with the superintendent and he allows me to set it up with the principals. And we go in with these blue ribbons um, and I set up a half in half hour increments. I visit every school and I talk to about this year, I think it was 2,200 students. And we just talk about stigma. But before I get there, The teachers educate the children. They make a banner. They wear a ribbon, a blue ribbon for recovery. We get there. And so back to the video, there's a video that needs to be shared on Stigma Day. You change your, it's an online campaign. So with all of this going on, we needed a video. um, So the Malden High School kids in the media team, uh, Mr. Jim Valenti and his kids said they would take on the project. So I explained what the project was and, I liked the video that they did because it was through the kids' eyes what they felt stigma is. And it was amazing. And that's how that came about. I went to visit the media team and Jim Valenti and asked them if they would take this on. I told them all what stigma day was about, what we're trying to do. And the kids ran with that. I had nothing to do with it. And uh, that was shown in every homeroom across the district on April 11th. Every single kid through... uh, sixth grade up got a chance to see that video i seen that video the other day and i just sat there with my mouth open it was an incredible video for the streamers out there you two can view this video this video was on youtube hashtag malden stop the stigma so you go to youtube hashtag malden stop the stigma also on twitter hashtag malden stop the stigma don't forget the hashtag hashtag malden stop the stigma and you will be able to view this video before we go on paul you had said that Education for the stigma and and just general awareness 
should start at a young age. And you said that this year you were able to go into the sixth, seventh, and eighth grades. I just want to say that the both the Chevrolet School and Malden Catholic, for those folks who are not familiar with the community of Malden, Massachusetts, those are private schools. So this year, Paul, you were in public and private schools. But my question to you is, what age should this education be beginning? Okay, and I'll explain. This this needs to be kindergarten, um, and I don't mean showing the stigma video. So what has to happen, I believe, which can change the game, and I, I, I'm going to press for this until it happens, is I talked about health class. So we feel that health class should be in, like when I was a kid, there was there was the D.A.R.E. program. There was all of these things in place that you would learn about. We feel at the kindergarten level, there should be a teacher teaching a health class all the way up through high school where you're teaching a curriculum every year. The first year in kindergarten could be strength building, positive affirmations, you know, this in first grade, a little bit more in second grade, a little bit more, you know, letting letting the health teachers put the curriculum in place. But by third, fourth and fifth grade the word drugs come up and we're teaching our kids about healthy choices and, and doing drugs is not a healthy choice. So if these, if these, if this curriculum is put into place by the time someone is in fifth or sixth grade, because let's face it, Nestor, that somewhere along the line, by the time a child is 12, they're going someone in their, in their friendship or in their world is going to have something and show them, and they'll have to make a choice what they're going to do. But if a child is educated, that child most likely will say, no, I don't want to do that. That's that's not good for me. And that's and that's where we come in now. So right now, we're, we're just helping people get into treatment, get into detox, and the wheel just keeps turning. And the kids that are coming up that are not educated are just falling into the trap. So we need to educate our young people, and I feel it, it, it starts with, with a health class in the proper curriculum. But again, we're talking funding. It's a lot of money to, to make that happen. You are so right about that age, that age 12. And for all the streamers out there, just think about your childhood when you were 12 years old. When you were 12 years old, there was certain temptations out there. I know when I was 12 years old, the temptation out there, the peer pressure out there was to try to smoke cigarettes. Now, mm-hmm. I, mm-hmm. I didn't. For me, I did not succumb to that. I was always playing sports, and I just wasn't going to risk being shortness of breath in my athletic endeavors at that time. But I just want to just stamp that, that that age 12, that's like universal since the beginning of time. Age 12, that's when that that's when that peer pressure really starts. It doesn't matter if it's if it's if it's drugs, alcohol, crime, whatever. Age 12. I just I just I just cannot stamp that enough. Recovery. That's correct. Recovery peer to peer. Talk about that. So um, what we're trying to do, we have a, a big initiative that, that, that we're, we're on the cusp of, of trying to help people. So you, you heard me talk about the, the uh, scholarship program that we help. So when someone gets that, the number one problem with the prevention and education is that five-day detox that we've already talked about. Somebody comes home, what do they do? And so you're feeling a lot of things. You're feeling like your life is over because your friends are still using everything you know. They, they, they teach you in detox, you have to change three things, people, places, and things. You can't hang around with the people you hang around with. You can't do the things you were doing, and you can't go to places you were going. Where does that leave you? That leaves you all by yourself. And when you're just coming out of a facility after five days, in the first four days, they gave you medication to help you come off of whatever it is you were doing. So technically you're 24 hours sober. You're in a bad spot and you have nowhere to go, nothing to do. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to, to bring a recovery center, a peer to peer recovery center to Malden. And we're really close to doing that. And just so I can reiterate a peer to peer recovery center is not a detox. It's not beds. It's open at 8 or 9 a.m., closing by 10 p.m., it's a resource center. 
It's a place for folks to go. And in this center, they will be job training, resume building. There will be resources. There will be computer classes. It's going to be a place where people can come and kind of bring themselves back into the world. So someone that might have been using for 10, 15 years, they, they kind of disconnected with the world. Their skills need a little um, refresher. And that's what the center is going to do. And not only that, it's going to put every single person in that center is going to be going through exactly what you're going through. So you're not alone anymore. And peer to peer means they run it. But we give them the blueprint and they're going to execute that blueprint. And then every night of the week, there'll be a different meeting. There might be an AA meeting. There could be an NA meeting. There's a family meeting. There's going to be Learn to Cope, which is working with families. There's going to be a Gamblers Anonymous meeting because, let's face it, in about a year and a half, we get a whole other animal coming a mile and a half away. We're going to be having a casino, which is going to bring a whole new world of addiction. So, you know, a recovery center is absolutely essential. There's 10 recovery centers across the state currently. And in each one of those communities, there are proven numbers and facts that crime is lower, that um, overdose rates are lower. It's it's better in those communities where those centers are than, than a community that doesn't have one. And the closest center to us on this side is in Lawrence, which is about 25 miles away. So the center we're proposing here in Malden would serve as Malden, Melrose, Somerville, Medford, Revere. We have 12 communities that could potentially put this center to use and We've identified a location. Um, it's not 100% yet, but we're looking at it. It is here in Malden, and we've just put in for a grant, which we'll know in July if, if that grant comes through. But this is a major breakthrough if we can, um, if Malden Overcoming Addiction can pull this off. We've come a long way in a very short time, and this would really, really be, I, I can't emphasize how huge this would be if we got this. Certainly three years is a short amount of time, but you have come and this organization, this organization have come very long way in three years. Earlier, Paul, you did say that Malden was close to realizing this recovery center. How close is close? Are we talking 13, 14 months close? Are we talking five, six months close? Are we talking in a couple of days? How close is close? Um, so I've been at it a year and a half now. We've been getting let down after let down. So we just got a timeline. Um, if the grant is accepted that we just put in for, um, there's three other partners, which I, I will be at liberty to say in July. Okay. So I'm going to know the answer. I'm going to get a yes or no answer on the grant in July. If we get a yes answer in July, we have 90 days to execute. So that means by October, um, will be up and running. I already have the building. I've already toured the building. Um, we have a landlord. We we just, again, it boils down to funding. So we're looking for folks to help us with funding. Um, there's, we, we just need money. And, and the grant that we're going for, it doesn't cover rent and it doesn't cover insurance. But the grant is for $250,000. The center will cost about four hundred thousand dollars a year to run and we're working directly with senator lewis and um, the state delegation to try to help us with the department of public health because dph funds the other 10 centers in massachusetts so another um the the senate house ways and means committee just put in 3.5 million for five centers they did that three days ago now the house has to pass that that's another avenue we're looking at this particular grant isn't from the state it's from an outside source so if we can just get the doors open we're convinced that we're going to be able to to sustain it but we're looking at i don't know i'd say uh six months from now hopefully but if they say no to the grant it'll get pushed back but i'm convinced it's coming no matter what i just the timeline is uh i'll know exactly in july in july paul my BTR mic will be available to you. I'm going to have you back for another podcast. So you yeah. so so you pretty much already book yourself, brother. I'm not going to I'm not going to book you July 1st because that's the first day of July. But may, but maybe I'll book you July 14th or 13th, but I'm going to have you back in July and hopefully the funding will go through and hopefully you're going to give us 
such doggone good news about this this recovery center will be here soon and this is the projected date and just so people know it's called the bridge the, it's the brc bridge recovery center um we have a name we have our partners we have a spot we have everything in place except the funding um i'm working with with state delegation and i can't say enough about mayor christensen um without mayor christensen as as he is our champion um this gentleman has i just can't say enough about the work he's done for us and everything starts at the top he sees the need for this just like we do and um uh, i'll use the word champion with him because he's uh He's just been absolutely amazing, and I, I need to emphasize that because if you don't have help from from your from your city leaders and state leaders, you'll never you'll never pull it off. And and they know they they know that you know we're not in an epidemic. An epidemic is is something that is generally confided into one area. We're in a pandemic. We're in a worldwide health crisis. This this is um, this is the worst thing I believe that I've seen in my lifetime because the rate of death is the highest rate of death out of anything in the history that I have come with. The, the numbers are staggering. You know, there are six people a day in Massachusetts who are dying, you know, in Malden alone. I, I see the overdoses every week. I see five, I see 10, I see four. I get the reports weekly. Those aren't fatalities, they're overdoses, but we're looking at, I think two weeks ago we had eight. Last week we had four. I mean, the, these you know the numbers and what is happening is it's just staggering. So we we really have to do something. Paul, there's been plenty of times offline and off the record that you told me Godzilla is coming. So please talk about what is Godzilla. Well, Nestor, I um we we got a chance to go to Washington to a fentanyl summit. And the uh, the president's drug czar was there, and 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 that gentleman had explained. He went over the numbers with us. He went over how it's coming into the border. He went over how the dogs at the border are dying because they're sniffing packages that contain fentanyl, and it's so powerful the dogs drop on the spot. So they they have since pulled the dogs off the border, which means this stuff is just coming right in, and. Um, you know, my question to him was, if the stuff is just coming right in, how do we stop it? And he said that they they wait for, um, you know, when it, it, it comes through in the San Diego corridor from Mexico and they wait for 10 or 15 bodies to, to pile up, as he put it. And then they go out and and they instantly can shut down where where this has happened. But meanwhile, it might have already went to Pennsylvania or went to Cincinnati. It's already on its way to Hampshire. So we, we are in a huge, huge crisis. And what he said to me when I asked him about the numbers, he said, if you think it's bad now, Godzilla is not here yet. These numbers are going to get so much worse. He said, give this three to five years. Um, and so he put it in terms that I, I tell people a lot. You mentioned cigarettes. So if you can wrap your head around this, he said that, you know, in the 20s and 30s, cigarettes started, you know, nine out of 10 people smoked. Now you're into the 40s and 50s. And what had happened by the 60s was they figured out something called secondhand smoke and people were getting sick and people were starting to get what they call lung cancer and people started to die. And people were getting sick at an alarming rate from cigarettes. So if you just look at cigarettes now, by the time the 80s and 90s came, all the commercials were coming out, but before the 80s and 90s, I don't know if you remember, but all I saw on TV was Joe Camerill, the Mabro man. They were making this stuff look really attractive. Now, today, by the year 2000, you can't smoke in any restaurants. Now we're into 2018. Nine out of 10 people really don't smoke anymore, but it took a generation of research people dying, and he said, that's exactly what's going on with this. With three in 2014, fentanyl hit. With three years into something, he said to me, "You'll be dead. Your kids will be dead. Their kids will see the change." It's two generations. The same thing as cigarettes. That made sense to me. That, that makes, was something I that that made a lot of sense to me. 
that makes sense to me as well. Wow. So yeah. So well, three only three years in, and we're three years into the fentanyl. Now it's four years, and since fentanyl hit, um, the, if you look at the numbers, the numbers don't lie. Just Google it. Um, the they're astronomical, and this is just getting worse. It's getting worse by the day. So uh, you know, I don't see a change coming right now, but if we as people and as human beings can can say, okay. Maybe we'll cut this funding, cut that funding. We'll get health classes in. If we start, it starts and ends with the kids. Yes. With that generation. That's where this starts and ends. They need to be educated because they're going to be the ones that shut this down. Not us. It's going to be them. And when the kids are coming up, somehow they have to be taught not to, by the time they're 11 or 12, when Johnny flicks that bag and says, yo, Timmy, check this out. Try this. Timmy needs to have that education to say, you know what? No, I'm good. You know, so that that's what we have to do. We have to educate the, the we have to educate the kids and deal with the problem now for the adults. And that's a recovery center. I'm convinced a recovery center is going to bring the numbers down. But we still need to educate our youth. It's all about the youth. The youth of the future. Let's face it, it's always been that way. We need to focus on the youth focus on educating the youth and also hopefully having a recovery center in Malden, Massachusetts sooner rather than later. Those are two good things. Once again, Malden, Massachusetts is located 5.5 miles north of Boston. Paul, this hour has flown by. So within this last minute, anything that you want to get out there? Yes, really quick. May 3rd, we're about three weeks out. We have our hashtag um, annual comedy fundraiser. It's the hashtag together we can fundraiser at the Irish American. Tickets are $25. Um, we, we, we need to pack that room. Last year we had over 300 people there. We're asking folks to come down, spend a night of laughter with us, you know, raising money for Malden Overcoming Addiction. We want to see the whole community there and just. Uh, just sit with us for an evening, learn about addiction, and then laugh with the comedy show. Please join us. We need you. Repeat that hashtag, please, brother. It's it's May 3rd. Yes. And the event is hashtag together we can comedy. It's hashtag together we can comedy fundraiser for more than overcoming addiction. Irish American. It's all over our website. It's on our Facebook page. And again, Malden Irish American, 177 West Street. Please come down May 3rd. Get yourself a ticket. Come in, have something to eat, and just laugh with us. Paul, thank you, thank you, thank you for being a guest on this program. I really enjoyed this podcast. This has been a lot of information given. Um, this will not be the only podcast I will have you on. Next podcast, I'm going to have you on. It's going to be July. We already, <laughs> <laughs> we already booked the month. So, Paul, what's the phone number again? To get in touch? 781-838-2203. That is the phone number. Paul Hammersley. His Twitter handle is at Mr. Hammer Time. The web, the email address, email address he can be reached at is Malden Overcoming Addiction at gmail.com. Facebook, the, Facebook, the organization, Facebook, Malden Overcoming Addiction. Instagram, Malden Overcomes. Snapchat at Malden overcomes <laughs> youtube malden overcome addiction twitter at malden overcomes check it out tweet it out retweet support again paul you're doing fantastic work thank you brother for all you are doing so far thank you for giving back to this city of malden nesta dudley it's been a pleasure thank you for having me on beyond the rim can be streamed on your favorite podcast app download us beyond the rim on itunes subscribe to beyond the rim youtube visit our website brand new website btrmike.com that's btrmic.com hashtag follow hashtag stream hashtag retweet i would appreciate that on twitter at nesta dudley until next time just want to say buenas noches Coochies, coochies. I came in peace. I leave with love. This is for the red, the black, and the green. Living cool, living calm, living clean. I'm out.